Uh, I will start. Today we will start on energy transport and hopefully we have about five weeks to cover that these topics. And the beauty of this is that everything will be the same in terms of the series of the content. If we recall what we have learned from Momentum, the first chapter is introduction of transport itself and introduction of Newton law, which is the only equation linking between what is transferring to what can be measured, right? Newton law is linking between tau and velocity. Moving on to the second chapter, that's a shear balance. We bring momentum flux in and out plus the ex external force as a momentum generation to form the balance, integrate the balance, which is, a move, which is the actual way to move the shell around the surface, uh, around the system, to obtain velocity profile of the whole system. The rest in the chapter two is basically examples, okay? In chapter three, in chapter three, that's a generalization of shell into equation, so that the equation can be applied to any kind of question. The rest is just examples, okay? Four, we skipped. Five is turbulent, and then six is interface. Interface means we want to create something that we can apply for macroscopic balance. That something in momentum section is friction factor, okay? So in energy, it would be the same. The first part of the energy balance or energy section is basically derivation or development of an equation linking what is transferring, with, which is energy, to what can be measured, which is temperature, okay? In the same manner as Newton law. Then moving on to the second chapter, that will be a shear balance of energy. Energy in, energy out, to create temperature profile of the whole system. And then third chapter will be generalization of equation so that the gener generic shell can be applied to any kind of problems. And then skip the turbulent and to the interface, which is creating one variable that can be applied for macroscopic balance. Everything will be exactly the same, okay? So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Hopefully it will be okay. So in general, let's start with the first chapter of energy balance or energy transport. In general, you have learned from your high school that there are two, three kinds of energy transport. If you can imagine, the first one would be conduction. Conduction is transfer of energy without moving of the transfer media. The great example is basically transfer of energy in solid. If you have hot body connect with cold body, energy will be transferred from hot body to cold body without moving of the body itself, right? That is called conduction. The second kind is called convection. When you flow, let's say you have hot plate, you flow cold water over hot plate. The water will become higher in temperature because it receives energy from the hot plate itself but the matter of receiving is basically cold body come to the contact of hot body, receive energy, and move away, okay? So that is called convection. And you have learned in unit operation three, or you are learning right now, that convection is much more important comparing to conduction. Third kind that you have learned is basically radiation. Radiation is a transfer of energy by emitting some radio wave, or not, not radio wave, uh, electromagnetic wave. It can be light, it can be infrared, it can be any kind of wavelength, right? In that case, you don't need a media. So radiation will not be covered in this class, okay? So this class will cover only two. Conduction, convection. I will introduce the fourth kind. I just want to give you a brief introduction, like so. If you have species A, let's say in fluid, and species B, 
in fluid like this. Normally, if you have partition at first and you remove the partition, there will be a driving force in terms of mass concentration of A on the left-hand side, which is higher than the right-hand side. It should give A to move from the left to the right by means of diffusion. In the same time, B would move back because concentration of B is high on the right-hand side, is low on the left-hand side. It would move by diffusion to the left, right? Now, if this side, the left-hand side, is higher in temperature originally, that means A is carrying high energy to the right-hand side part. This has nothing to do with flow, okay? So this is energy carrying by means of diffusion. And different species can carry different amount of energy because different species have different heat capacity, okay? So in this case, in, you know, on one side, A carry energy to the right-hand side. On the other side, B carry energy back to the left-hand side. If the heat capacity would be the same, there would be no net flux. But if the energy or if the ability of A can carry more energy to the right-hand side, then there will be net flux going to the right. This is called diffusive energy transport. And this will be covered after we finish mass transport, okay? Because it requires mass transport here. So let's skip that for the moment. Now, let's go back to what we have learned in Momentum, <coughs> when we derive the momentum, uh, New Newton law, we set up experiments, okay? If you recall this board, there's a two plates and liquid inside. The upper plate is fixed. The lower plate at, the temp at time equal to zero, you start moving this plate with constant velocity V. And then at steady state, liquid inside should move and there will be a velocity profile, okay? We monitor and we measure and we hypothesize, uh, we come up with the formula, this equation, right? Shear stress depends on velocity gradient. And later on, we said, oh, this term, not only is shear stress, it also represents momentum flux. And general, after you consider this in one direction, if you incorporate all directions, you end up with this vector notation, okay? Same thing, if we set up the equation or set up the experiments, starting with, let's say, liquid or solid. Let's say this is a solid body, solid. So there is no movement of fluid inside the system. Upper part is temperature T0, lower part temperature T0. So at T, at initial stage of the experiments, everywhere is T0 in temperature, okay? So if at time equal to zero, you change the temperature from T0 here to T1, and T1 is higher than T0. So that means right at the initial state, the temperature here would jump up there, okay? And you can imagine that, of course, if you can keep this part to be a constant temperature T Z T1 and keep the higher part to have a constant temperature T0, eventually, this area should have higher temperature. So there'll be a flux of energy moving from high temperature region to low temperature region. And at steady state, you can plot temperature profile. This is T1, this is T0, and temperature profile would be linear, okay? So this line is basically temperature as a function of position or temperature profile in the same manner as what we discussed in momentum transport, okay? 
So that means energy, a group of energy, will be transported from one location to another after some certain area receive energy, temperature would increase. So eventually, at steady state, let's say I, I look at this position, this position receive energy from position underneath and then release energy to a position above it so that everything would reach steady state. Okay? So if the thickness of this solid slab is Y, then we can say that the amount of energy transported, let's say heat, okay, in this case, energy is transported in terms of heat. In thermodynamics, we define the transfer of energy in two ways. If you recall, let's say if we define the solid as a solid, as a system, Okay, in thermodynamics, this system is closed system. There's no mass moving in or out. This is closed system. Within closed system, according to thermodynamics, there are only two kinds of energy transport across system boundaries. First is heat. Second kind is work, right? Heat would occur whenever you have temperature difference. Work would be everything else. In this case, there is temperature difference, so energy transport from this hot side to the system should be by means of heat. So I call this one heat, okay? So of course, amount of heat here, if I have, uh, the unit of heat here is joule per second. With fixed amount of heat, the temperature that would be affected by this heat depends on how big the slab is. If the slab is very big in, in the area, small amount or limited amount of heat cannot increase much temperature. So it depends on heat over area. Okay? So that actually is proportional to temperature difference. The difference would be considered high temperature subtracted by low temperature. Without temperature difference, doesn't matter how high the temperature would be, there would be no heat. Let's say I have 1,000 degrees C, but 1,000 degrees C everywhere, there'll be no heat. Okay? But if I have on this side 10 degree, on this side 0 degree, there will be heat transfer. So what matter is not the temperature, it's the temperature difference, okay? So it depends on delta T. This delta is one temperature subtracted by another. The difference is a difference with respect to location. In thermodynamics, we consider delta T, T final subtracted by T initial. That's two stages. In transport phenomena, this delta T depends on two positions. Okay? All right. We should also consider here, if the slab is thick, if it is thick with fixed delta T, amount of heat transfer should be large to keep that delta T. I'm, I'm sorry, to be small. The gradient should be very small. So therefore, the heat flux here should inversely proportional to the thickness of the slab. Okay? So according to this proportionality, if you change to equality, you need one constant. The constant is called K, or thermal conductivity. Okay? So K is thermal conductivity. If you look at the unit, on the left-hand side, W should have unit of joule per second, which is heat rate. Joule per second is basically watt. Divided by area, which is meter squared. 
On the right hand side, delta T is in Kelvin divided by Y, which is thickness. This is meter. So the unit of K is supposed to be what per meter Kelvin? That would be unit of K. Okay? Talk about K a little bit. Thermal conductivity is a characteristic properties of materials. Different materials have different K. That's for sure. Okay? But there are two things that you need to be aware of. First, some materials have K depending on direction. It might be confusing, but imagine this. If you have a cube of material, if material have same K in all directions, that means heat conduction in this direction or that direction should be the same. Okay? So that means if you keep delta T in this direction and that direction to be the same, amount of heat transfer should be the same. In that kind of material, K is not function of direction. Some, some other material may have K depending on the direction. For instance, some material may have transfer in this direction higher than transfer in this direction. Can you imagine of such kind of material? That heat transfer in one direction is better than heat transfer on another direction? Very common example is wood. Wood. Why? Because wood has, you know, ring. When you cut the wood, you have ring, right? The heat transfer, if I have ring like this, ring of wood, heat transfer in this direction is difficult because the ring itself is small gap. But heat transfer perpendicular to this ring or heat transfer in the direction of the growth of the wood itself does not have ring, so heat transfer in that direction is faster. Okay? This kind of thing, this kind of material is called anisotropic material. Another example of anisotropic material is metal. If the material, if you look inside the materials, look inside metals, there will be a lot of grains. Okay, there will be a grain, grain of materials, or grain of metals. If the grain is symmetry, or if the grain is spherical, then conduction in this direction and that direction would be the same. But if the grain itself looks like this, That means conduction in this direction should be faster than this direction because grain is considered as insulator. Right? Conduction in this direction goes through the material. Conduction in this direction goes through a lot of grains. So different direction give you different heat transfer ability. This material is called anisotropic material as well. Okay? That's one thing that you need to learn about thermal conductivity. You have learned this in Unit Operation 3 already, but someone might not mention this. Okay? Another one that you need to realize is that thermal conductivity sometimes does not follow mixing rule. For instance, if you have material A with thermal conductivity Ka and material B with thermal conductivity Kb, if you mix it up to get alloy, let's say alloy AB, 
your common sense would say that thermal conductivity of AB or KAB should be in between these two values, right? But it is not. It is not necessary. For instance, copper would have thermal conductivity is around 380 uh, Kelvin, uh, watt Kelvin, watt per meter Kelvin, that's for copper. Zinc would have around 120 watt per meter Kelvin. If you mix it up into copper zinc alloy, what is the name, the common name of copper zinc alloy? Brass. Okay? When you have brass, the thermal conductivity of brass is only around 100. Smaller. Um, brass is less conductive than copper and zinc. Why? Because when you form brass, there will be a lot of grains inside. A lot of grains mean lower conductivities. Okay? So when you try to, you know, when you try to design heat exchanger and you try to choose the material of your tube or your wall or your shell, don't assume that mixing rule for conductivity would be applied. It is not. Okay? Now, go back to this equation. In the same manner as what we did, the Newton law was developed this way, and then we confine big system to small region in the system. Okay, we confine the overall flux, momentum flux, to flux like this, and then consider velocity profile or velocity gradient to be dv by dy. If we apply the same concept, when you apply, when you confine the system to be very small, delta t by the length turns to be dt by dy. Right? K remains the same. This side on the left hand side, the heat rate divided by area is called heat flux. This is called QY. It's a heat flux in Y direction. So this is what we call Fourier law. Fourier's law. So if I put the picture like this on the board, I will get very similar picture. This is T0, T1, and temperature profile. Okay? So you see that in momentum transport, right now in this picture, momentum is transferring from high velocity region to low velocity region. This is momentum flux, right? For energy, you have energy flux going from high temperature region to low temperature region. So driving force for energy transport, in this case, is temperature difference or temperature gradient. The equation, this is Newton law. For energy transport, you get Fourier law. Qy equal to k dt by dy. Similar form of equation. Both of them was obtained from experiment. So I would like to emphasize that these two equations are not theory. They, was, they were obtained from experiment. Okay? Then, if this equation was expand to cover all three directions. You may have heat transfer or heat flux in x direction, y direction, and z direction. When you combine all three elements, you end up with heat flux as a vector. Okay? On the right-hand side, you get K 
assuming that k in this case are equal in all directions. And then dt by dy, if you consider all directions, you get dt by dx, dt by dy, and t, dt by dz. Combined together, that gives you del t. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. One thing that I neglect. dt by dy itself is a slope of this line. It's negative by nature. But heat flux is going in positive direction, positive y. So this is negative, this is positive. In order to maintain the sign, you need negative sign over here. So we need negative k, negative k over there. Okay? So the difference between these two sessions in momentum, the equation is tensor. This is tensor. Okay, so this tensor has nine element. For energy side, this is vector. It has only three elements. So equation is a little bit easier in vectors. Now, in momentum, we have defined, if you take mu divided by density, this is called nu. Have I mentioned this? This ratio is called kinematic viscosity. Okay? It's called kinematic viscosity. The unit of mu is pascal second. The unit of density would be kilogram per cubic meter. Pascal is basically kilogram per meter second square. So if you're canceling, if you cancel all the units, you end up with meter square, meter square per second. This would be a unit of kinematic viscosity. Don't be confused, this is not the same unit as acceleration. Acceleration is meter per second square. This is meter square per second. Okay? In the same manner, if I define alpha equal to K over rho CP, this CP with a hat is heat capacity per unit mass. Okay? If you look at the unit, K would be watt meter per second. Rho would be kilogram per cubic meter, and CP would be joule per kilogram Kelvin. Watt is joule per second. Canceling this unit, you end up with meter square per second in the same manner as kinematic viscosity. All right? So therefore, if I go one step further, take the ratio of this kinematic viscosity over alpha. Oh, by the way, this alpha is called thermal diffusivity. Okay? So if you take kinematic viscosity over thermal diffusivity, these two variables have same unit. The ratio is supposed to be dimensionless. Okay? This dimensionless number is called Prando number. You have seen Prando number in unit operation three.
Okay? So in physical meanings, kinematic viscosity, in other words, it can be called momentum diffusivity. Okay? So it has something to do with the flow. On the other hand, thermal diffusivity, it has something to do with energy transport. So this ratio is, you will see Prando number whenever in your system there is a flow and there is a heat transfer together. So the system like heat exchanger, when you have flow of fluid into the pipe, and at the same time, there'll be heat transfer from that fluid, Prandtl number would always appear. Okay? Any question? Next part, you have to realize by defining something like this, energy is transported without the movement of molecules. No movement at all. Basically, atom of solid at high te higher temperature vibrating more. Once it's vibrating, it transfers vibration from one position to another. So in general, it seems like energy is transported from one way to another. Okay, it's basically induction of vibrating from one, sp one spot to another. All right, so that is considered as molecular energy transport. Remember, we have two kinds of transport, molecular transport and convective transport. Molecular transport is transport by molecule itself, no movement of molecules involved. The second kind is convective transport is transport by the flow. This is essentially molecular transport. So you can say that conduction is molecular transport. This is conduction. Okay? Now, we always have another kind of transport which is convective transport. How can we define convective transport? We will do the same thing as what we did in momentum transport. Let's consider the system in this coordinate. If there's velocity, there's fluid flowing with some certain velocity going in any generic direction. Okay? If the area here say is called ds. So if I calculate volumetric flow rate through the area ds, this is in x direction. Okay. In this case, you can expand velocity into Vx, Vy, and Vz. So the only element entering this highlight area is Vx. Okay? So the volumetric flow rate through that area is basically corresponding to Vx. Vx has unit of meter per second. Volumetric flow rate is supposed to be cubic meter per second. So you need to multiply by area. That area would be area perpendicular to the velocity itself, right? 
Okay? So if the fluid is flowing into the system, if my cube is a system, that means the fluid is supposed to have energy. So fluid entering the system means energy is entering the system. This energy is carried by the fluid itself. So this is convective transport. Okay? So the energy transported through this area. This amount of energy, if I said rate of energy, transport, depends on two things. First, it depends on how fast the fluid is moving into the system, right? So it definitely depends on volumetric flow rate. Another factor depends on how high of the energy that this amount of fluid carries, okay? So the energy carried by the fluid, at this stage, we will consider two kinds of energy. Kinetic energy and internal energy. In thermodynamics, we said there are three kinds of energy, kinetic, potential, and internal, okay? I will show you in a minute that in transport, internal, um, I'm sorry, potential energy will be combined with another term later on. So at this point, we will consider only two kinds of energy, kinetic energy and internal energy. Kinetic energy is one over two mv squared, but this is volume by unit already. In order to get unit of energy, it's supposed to be m rho v squared. This is kilogram per cubic meter, multiplied by cubic meter per second, you end up with kilogram per second, okay? So the whole thing here would be joule per second. Added by internal energy, U with the hat means internal energy per unit mass. I'm sorry. That's supposed to be rho U, Vx ds. Okay? If you look at the unit, the whole thing here is kilogram per cubic meter. That's rho. V means meter per second. V square means meter square per second square. That would give you joule per meter cube. Okay? Or you can say this is m over v, mv squared, that's joule, right? So you have joule per cubic meter. Multiply by this volumetric flow rate, which is meter cube per second, you end up with joule per second. That's energy rate. Same thing, u here should have unit of joule per kilogram, that's specific internal energy, multiplied by rho, which is kilogram per cubic meter, you end up with joule per volume. Multiply by volumetric flow rate, you end up with joule per second. All right? You have to be clear on this point, okay? This Vx is vector component of the velocity. This V is kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy depends on overall velocity. It, it depends on all velocity component. So that means this velocity here is equal to or uh, if I said 1 over 2 rho v squared, 
that means 1 over 2 rho vx square vy square plus vc square. Okay? Kinetic energy depends on all velocity components combined. But this volumetric flow rate considers only one direction. This is scalar. Energy is scalar. Okay? This is part of the vector. Okay? So that means if I want energy flux in x direction, what would it be? This is rate of energy transport through this area. That means in x direction, right? The unit would be joule per second here. If I want energy flux, that would be joule per meter square per second. You have to divide that by the area perpendicular to the flux. You divide by area ds. So energy flux is basically 1 rho v square plus rho u vx. You just move this ds to the left hand side and that becomes energy flux. In similar manner, if you write it down for y direction, it would be the same thing times Vy. This is the, whatever in the parentheses here is the energy that the fluid carries. So whether it's going in x or y or z direction, it carries the same amount of energy. Okay? So in z direction, it will be exactly the same. So if you combine all directions together, you end up with the energy flux in general, okay? So if I said total energy flux, now that would be 1 over 2 rho v squared plus rho u times vector v. In other words, you just add unit vector i, j, k and combine them all to get vector, okay? So in this case, you have to understand that V is a vector, but energy here is scalar. So that means this V square is also scalar. This V square, don't be confused, is not vector, it's a scalar. So this is magnitude of, the ve uh, magnitude of velocity. So please notice I did not put underline here, so this is magnitude. This is a vector, okay? So that is convective energy flux. Any question?
Now, we have 30 minutes, right? Now we try to combine thermodynamics and transport phenomena together so that you get one big picture, okay? In transport phenomena, in general, there will always a flow. So whenever we discuss convective transport, there will be a flow of fluid in the system. So whenever you have flow of fluid, that means the system is open system. It's not closed system anymore, okay? According to what you learn in thermodynamics, for closed system, I'm sorry, for open system, we have first law like this. This is open system energy balance. All right? You have to notice something. In this equation, I intentionally put equation that is not very useful because in thermodynamics, actually, if I rewrite it again, This is the equation that you use in thermodynamics. We normally put enthalpy here. And the work here would be shaft work, right? Shaft work is normally considered uh, spinning of any shaft, any propellant, a propeller, right? Before getting this equation, we start with this part, saying that energy entering the system has three kinds, internal, kinetic, potential. So this is energy carried by the fluid going in, going out. And for open system, there are two kinds of energy transfer without dealing with mass. The two kinds is heat and work, right? And then the work here can be split into two parts, flow work and shaft work. If you combine flow work to internal energy, you end up with enthalpy, leaving only sharp work. That's what we define in thermodynamics, right? So if I said this is flow work plus sharp work, and flow work was combined with internal energy to get enthalpy, so whenever you use the second equation in thermodynamics, you use enthalpy, and you don't have to worry about flow work anymore. Understand? Remember? Now, in transport phenomena, I want to step back to this original equation. So I want to erase this equation for the moment. We will write it up again. OK? From what I wrote on that board, these two part, internal energy and kinetic energy, is considered as convective transport. Okay, so this term is convective transport going in. This term is convective transport going out. So these red two, two red terms subtracted together is basically net convective transport. In minus out, that's net going in. Okay.
this term is basically conduction. In thermodynamics, we said that this term is a heat transfer without the flow. In transport, anything going without the flow, that's conductive transport or molecular transport. So this term is net conduction. Again, again, in minus out, that's net going in. If in is greater than out, net going in is positive. That means you have something going in, right? So these two terms, you can, be, you can see that it splits into two terms, in and out. But this term is already net conduction. That means it's already net going in. So if this term is positive, that means there is energy going in as conduction. If it is negative, that means there's an energy going out as conduction. If your system has conduction in and out, it depends whether which one is larger. If in is larger, this term will be positive. If out is larger, this term will be negative. Okay? For work, we have flow work, we have shaft work. Shaft work will be divided into two parts, mechanical shaft work and non-mechanical work. For instance, you may have electricity going out from the system. That's considered non-mechanical work. Okay? In thermodynamics, we said this non-mechanical work can be calculated based on gift free energy, if you can recall. All right? So, we talked about these red terms already, but the energy balance is not completed yet. In transport, we will neglect this mechanical shaft work. Why? Normally, mechanical shaft work is basically whenever you have a system with a flow going in and out, this is mechanical shaft work. This flow spinning some turbine, getting the work out, right? And in thermodynamic, we consider in and out. And this would be energy transfer without the mass from, for the overall balance. But in transport, we look inside small, small part of the system. Whenever you have propeller inside, it disturbs all the fluid. Everything will be disturbed. So for simple transport phenomena, we just simply neglect this one. For complicated transport phenomena, when you introduce this one, you have to recalculate all the velocity profile. It's no longer simple velocity profile. So at this stage, at the simple stage, we just say that let's ignore this for the moment. So there'll be no shaft going in and out of the system. This term will be ignored. So I'm going to ignore this one for simplicity of the, our equation. Okay, so we do not want disturbance within the system. Okay, then potential energy. You see that potential energy has something to do with gravity. If you look into equation from chapter three, Navier-Stokes equation, we have the term from external force. That external force is gravity. So we will try to combine this one as a work from gravity, okay? So these two terms will be reserved specially, specially for gravity work or result from gravity. So the rest, to complete the equation, we need this term, flow work. Okay? So I need to derive something about flow work.
this flow work will be considered as flow work in subtracted by flow work out. All right. Okay, so we, we will now talk about flow work. For flow work, it means the work from fluid pushing the system. Flow, fluid flowing in, push the system in, hence do the work. Work by pushing can be calculated based on force times distance, okay? Force is a vector, work is scalar. In order to convert vector to scalar, we need dot product. Distance can be represented by vector distance. You dot them together, you end up with work. If you differentiate it, force is constant, you differentiate the vector distance. If you differentiate it with respect to time, keep the force constant, this would be dr by dt, which is velocity. Right? Look at the unit. Work is joule per time second. This is Newton. This is meter per second. Newton, met, Newton meter is joule. Okay. If you recall momentum transport, we said momentum flux, overall momentum flux or combined flux can be split into convective transport, molecular transport, and pressure term. We can combine these two together and call this one pi. So pi is basically tau plus pressure. The unit of tau or unit of pi would be Newton per square meter seconds. It is shear stress. So force divided by, oh, I'm sorry. Shear stress is force divided by area, okay? If you look at the surface, I draw this picture once. If this is y, x, z. On this surface, there'll be tau acting on this surface, okay? You can imagine this tau to be resolved from the force acting on the surface. The surface is perpendicular to x-axis, so this tau is supposed to have the first, uh, the first subscript to be x. The second subscript, the force is going in z direction, so this tau is supposed to be tau xz. Understand? In other words, if you draw tau xz, that would mean force in z direction acting on the surface, and that surface should be perpendicular to x direction. So x direction surface, or surface perpendicular to x direction, supposed to be this surface. What about this tau? What is this tau? It's 
is act on the same surface, so this is supposed to be x. But the force is going in y direction. This is tau y, x y. Right? Last one would be this one, would be tau x x. And you add another one, which is pressure. This is pressure times vector in x direction. So all these red lines are associated with force acting on this, surf, this surface. OK? So if all these forces is related to this work, if I combine all these forces to this part, we can calculate work. Work would be done by this force. And force was appear by the flow of, of, the, of the liquid itself. So therefore, this work is supposed to be work associated with the flow. That's why it's called flow work. OK? So if I calculate rate of work done on surface, let's say this surface has area ds. The unit supposed to be oh, work per second. All right. So this work per second is this term. Can be calculated from force dotted by velocity. In this case, there are four forces. These four forces are combined by this pi. Okay? So this is pi in x direction. Pi itself is tensor. If you draw the tensor as a matrix, you get matrix 3 by 3. If you look at one row, that's pi x. Pi x would have three members. By itself, it is vector. OK? You can imagine pi x, pi y, and pi z to be vector. Combine all these three pi, you get tensor. So this is force dotted by velocity. That would be rate of work. All right? Multiply by ds. Because this pi is work per area. In order to get force, you get pi multiplied by area itself. Right? Once again, we need force, but pi is force per area. So we need area over here to get Newton multiplied by meter per second. So if I take ds to the left hand side, that would be work per area, per time, which is flux. That would be pi x dot v. This is flux in x direction. If you calculate for all direction, then you get tensor pi dot the v. So basically, you combine pi x, pi y, pi z together, dot with the same v, you get tensor v dotted by vector. Now, vector dot vector, you get scalar. Tensor dot vector, you get vector. OK? Any question? So if I go back to this picture, I will say that my conduction is Q. It's a vector Q. My convective transport is 1 over 2 rho v squared plus rho u times v. My flow work here 
is basically pi dot v. All right. If you notice, this is vector. This is vector time scalar, which is vector. This is tensor dot vector. You end up with vector. So the whole thing would be vector equation. Okay. Now, if I combine these three terms, if I split this conduction and combine convective transport, conductive transport, and flow work together, if I said Q plus rho V square, rho U V, plus pi dot v, OK? So basically, I combine all red terms together. And I can split this q into q in and q out. Combine all in term and combine all out term together. I can get this as what we call combined flux. So may, I may have e in and e out. So E in is basically this term in, half of this term, and this term. All right? So I can convert this thermodynamics equation into flux equation. This is flux going in. OK? Flux going out would be the same thing, except that it's going out. All right, so if I plug this equation, let's say I put this into Q in subtracted by Q out, okay? I can get E in and E out. The whole term, the whole equations would be rate of energy in, OK? Convective, conductive flow work in, subtracted by rate of energy out. Everything would be the same except it's going out. Okay? So all red terms are basically these two terms. What we have left here is this gravity related terms. So you said added by rate of work. by external force. And we keep in mind that the external force is gravity. So this term, rate of work by external force, is essentially potential energy, originally in thermodynamics. OK? So this term was taken care of. The red terms was, were taken care of. What we have left, this part will be split into mechanical, which is ignore non-mechanical, so we have only this term left, right? This non-mechanical work will be called energy production. So you add it by rate of energy production. 
which has no sense in thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, we said energy cannot be produced. So in order to understand this textbook, you have to understand that this term, rate of energy production, is essentially non-mechanical work like electricity, when you apply electricity into the system, in thermodynamics point of view, you apply work, which is non-mechanical work. In this point of view, he said, you have external source of energy entering the system. That is called energy production, okay? Equal to zero as steady state. So this is an equation for shell energy balance. So of course, this in and out term will be related to E. And E was defined here. All right? And we know that pi dot V is equal to pi itself is pressure plus tau. If you split the dot, split the pi into pressure and tau, you can split this term into two terms, okay? And you see that this PV is scalar times vector V. I can bring this to the first term. I take this here. Okay? And if you consider these two terms, I can take rho out to get u plus p over rho. Right? And from the definition of enthalpy, enthalpy is internal energy plus PV. This is specific volume that would be equal to inverse of density. So U plus P over rho is essentially enthalpy. So this term is basically enthalpy. So I can write the combined flux as conductive transport plus 1 over 2 rho v squared plus rho h v plus tau dot v. This tau would be the same tau as in momentum transport. Then we can use this combined flux in our shear balance and find temperature profile. That will be in the next chapter. All right? Any question? So in general, for summary for today, basically we start by introduction of Fourier law it was obtained in the same manner as Newton's law by experiments. From macroscopic experiments, uh, narrow down to microscopic equation, generalized from one dimension to three dimensions, and considered as, as a molecular transport. We define tr convective transport, and we define work, flow work, associated with the transport. And rearranged the equation of energy balance that we learned in thermodynamics in alternate way is essentially, they are essentially the same, just represented differently, okay? And at the end, we get combined flux in and out, work by gravity, and work by non-mechanical work. The rest will be examples. All right? Uh, next week, please follow the announcement in Costville 
I am not sure whether I can go abroad. There's a quarantine, and there's an announcement prohibiting faculties to go abroad. So I am not sure whether I can go abroad. So I will find out and make announcement within this week. All right. Okay, so let's wait and see whether we have a class next week. <laughs>